back in 2022, Snowflake made the acquisition of a company called Streamlit for 800 million US dollars. So why do that and what does it mean for you? Well, Streamlit turns data scripts, essentially Python scripts, into shareable web apps in just minutes, all using Python code. And you can do that using data, um, not necessarily in Snowflake, but obviously that is one of the best ways to use it, but also data in an S3 um, bucket, cloud storage location, or other databases as well, all without any front-end experience. So in this video, join me as I get my hands dirty with Streamlit for the very first time, where we set up Streamlit, we go through a number of different features and functionality and find out how easy and accessible it is to create intuitive web applications. My name is Adam Morton, and I've written a couple of books on Snowflake. I've also been lucky enough to speak in front of my peers on a number of occasions. I've lived and worked in the UK, Europe, and Australia during my career. And today, I'm on a mission to help as many people as I can fulfill their career potential by adding as much value as I can around data strategy and modern cloud data platforms. So there's a few ways to get started using Streamlit. The first one is to go to streamlit.io and sign up for the Streamlit Community Cloud, which I've done previously. Once you sign up, then you can connect it to your GitHub repository and create a new application, as I'll show you in a second. From that point on, then, you can then go in to edit your Python files within your GitHub repository directly by just typing Python code in there. Uh, here's a very basic example just to start us off on this journey. Um, we have added a title, a header, and some text. And of course, import the Streamlit libraries into that. You then commit your changes and you refresh your app. And you can see the output of this app here. A very basic example there. There are other ways to install and work with Streamlit, both on Windows and on Mac, and you can create a virtual environment. And you can do that if you want within Anaconda, which is probably one of the most popular and user-friendly ways to do that. It's really good uh, documentation and installation instructions on the Streamlit website, and I will include the link to that in the video description below if you're interested in how to do that. For now, though, we're not going to do that for this particular video. I'm going to work from my GitHub repository and switch between the, the two windows, as I just showed you before. Now, in this particular video, we're going to just run through a tutorial that's available on the Streamlit website on their documentation. And we're going to use some of Streamlit's core features to create an interactive app exploring a public Uber data set for pickups and drop-offs in New York City. Now, when you're finished, you'll know how to fetch and cache data, draw charts, plot information on a map, and use interactive widgets like a slider to filter results. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new repository. So I'm going to click Repositories, click New, give it a name, Streamlit Demo which is public, and I'm going to create repository. So in my new repository, I'm going to create a new file. And I'm going to call it uber underscore pickups.py. I'm going to commit that file as an empty file to start with, first of all. So it is, here's my file. Now I'm going to go back to my Streamlit dashboard. I want to click new app. I'm going to pick my new repository that I've just created, Streamlit demo, my branch and the file that I've just popped in there, uberpickups.py. And I'm going to click deploy. Now what this will do, it will create a Streamlit app that will link the Streamlit application to the Python file, even though it's empty that I've just created, but that will just result in an empty app. This takes a minute or so, so I'm going to pause the video while this takes place. Okay, and there you have it. There's our app up and running, ready to go. You just present it with simply a blank page. So the first thing that we need to do is go back to our Python file and start to edit this file. And the first thing we're going to do is import the Python libraries that we're going to need for this particular project, Streamlit, Pandas, and NumPy. And then we're going to add a title for the app, which is st.title uber pickups in NYC. And so now what we can do with that we can commit those changes and then move back across to our application and you can see it's refreshed now. We have our application title in there ready to go. So running a Streamlit app is no real different to running any other Python script. 
we can simply make edits in the Python file, flick to our app, and then see those updates happen in, in real time. So the development process is really iterative. Now we've got an app, the next thing that we need to do is fetch the Uber data set for pickups and drop-offs in New York City. So let's start by writing a function to load the data. And the next thing we're going to do is define a date column as a particular data type. So we've got this variable set up here. And the URL we're going to use, this data is sitting in the Amazon S3 bucket, publicly available. Um, so you can use it as well if you want to follow along from home. Next, we're using this uh, load data function, which is this plain old function that downloads some data, puts it into the pandas data frame, and converts the date column from text to date time here. The function is going to accept a single parameter called in rows, and that specifies the number of rows we want to load into that data frame. So now we can test the function and review this output as follows. So here we can set a bit of text saying load and data. We can call our function with 10,000 uh, passing through in there as a value so to return 10,000 rows of data into the data frame. And then we update the text to say it was done for the application. So if we just commit the changes here, we click back to our application, load and data appears and done. So we've now now we've loaded 10,000 records into our pandas data frame behind the scenes so we can now do something with that as part of our application. Let's move on to building this out because we don't want to reload the data every single time the app is updated. So we're going to look into caching data next. So right before we load our data or call the function to load our data, we're going to put this at streamlet.cache data in there. Now, if I was just to save the application at this stage, we wouldn't see any difference because it's the first time now that we uh, are recompiling the app with the cache data in there. So before doing that, I'm gonna change this line of code here to say it's all done using cache data. So what we'll do now is we'll commit those changes and quickly go back to the app. When this refreshes now, what we should see very quickly when we refresh it is that straight away it's presenting the done message now on every subsequent refresh because the data is now cached. There's no need for the application to come up saying loading data anymore because straight away it's already loaded that data from the cache. It's really easy to do that by just adding a line of code in there. So when you mark a function with this cache annotation, that tells Streamlit that whenever the function is called, it should check for two things. It'll check the input parameters that I use to make sure they haven't changed and the code inside the function. If it's the first time Streamlit has seen the items with those exact values and the exact combination, it runs the function and stores that result in the local cache. So the next time the function is called then, if the two values haven't changed, and Streamlit knows it can skip over that function. Not, it doesn't need to execute it, and instead reads the output from the local cache and passes it back to the caller. So what happens if we want to just take a look at the raw data before we start working with it? Well, we can add a subheader, and we can print out the raw data to the app. So here we're going to put the subheader raw data in there, and then we're going to use the streamlit.write command. That renders almost anything that you pass to it. Uh, so in this case, we're passing the data frame to it, and it's going to render as an interactive table. Let's commit those changes and see what happens. Here we go. So now we've got our subheading and our data frame with our 10,000 records in there is an interactive table. Again, really simple, really easy to work with this. Um, very powerful by just adding a couple of lines of code to add these visuals onto the Streamlit application. So next up then, we're going to add a histogram. So we've had the chance to look at the data set now, see what's available in there. So we're going to add the histogram to see what Uber's busiest hours are in New York City. So at the start, we're going to go back into edit our file. We'll add a subheader and we'll call it number of pickups by hour. And then we're going to use the 
NumPy to generate a histogram that breaks down those pickup times by the hour. So this looks like this. We can add a histogram, breaking it down by the hour portion of that date column that we've loaded into our data frame, breaking it down into 24 different hours and then specifying the range that we're going to use as well. After that, then we can use streamlit's bar chart function or method, if you like, to draw this histogram. Now, we should be able to commit those changes and see the results take shape pretty much immediately when the application refreshes. Here we go. So these are 24 different hours in the day. And to draw this diagram, we just use Streamlit's native bar chart method, but it's important to know that Streamlit supports more complex chart and libraries. So check out the documentation if you're interested in that. So now we can see what times the peak times are and the busiest and quietest times for Uber taxis in New York City. You can see that 5 p.m. is the busiest time. But what if we wanted to figure out where those pickups were concentrated throughout the city? So we could use a bar chart to show the data, but it wouldn't be very easy to interpret it unless you were really familiar with longitude and latitude coordinates in the city itself. So to show the pickup concentration, we can use a, another function um, in Streamlit called map to overlay the data onto a map of New York City. So we're going to go back to our file once again. We're going to click edit again, and we're going to add a subheader to say map of all pickups. And then we're simply going to add st.map, pass in the data frame, commit our changes, go back here. And this is a really good example of just how powerful and quick and easy it is to use Streamlit once you've got your data accessible within a data frame. So immediately adding basically one line of code um, to the existing, to take the existing data frame we had and plot it on the map makes it very, very easy. Now at the moment, makes it very easy to look at this and visualize it. Now we can zoom in and zoom out. We can't actually interact with anything at the moment because what would be really good is if I wanted to filter by a particular hour and break down where these pickups and drop-offs were occurring at that point in time. So one way of doing that is that we could redraw the map to show the concentration of pickups at 5 p.m. So go back to our file. The two lines that we've added before to put the map updater on there, we're going to replace it. And now we can say we want to filter by hour number 17 um, by creating this variable to use here. Um, we can then filter the data based upon that value we've passed in 17. Here's our subheader, and in this case, we're now passing in the hour to filter value as part of that subheader, so it's a bit more dynamic. And then the filter data value, which is our filter data frame set, pass that into the map function. So we've had to do this ahead of time. We've looked at our data, we've analyzed our data. We know that five o'clock in the afternoon is our busiest time, therefore we can hard code that at the moment and put that straight in there and the map updates instantly. Now that's all well and good, but typically we are producing these applications for end user consumption and we want to give them an element of interactivity because we don't know what questions they're going to ask or, or how they want to look at the data. So let's see how we can then filter results with a slider. And again, really easy to use this. We'll go back into our streamlit code here, navigate to our hour to filter line, and we're going to change this now to a streamlit slider. And um, we're specifying by the hour. And you can also give it a default and a maximum and a minimum to go to as well. Again, really easy to use. This is what's happening here. So this is our minimum value zero, our maximum is 23 and our default 17. And we've added a comment alongside it to help anybody looking at this code after the fact know what's going on. We commit those changes. We go back to our Streamlit application and now look at that. Straight away, we've got a slider, it's interactive. So I can then put that to eight in the morning. I can zoom in to where these pickups were. I can go back to the quietest time of the day 
2 a.m. in the morning, see exactly where these pickups. So sliders are just one way to dynamically change how the app looks. We can also use the checkbox function to add a checkbox to the app. So we can use this then to show or hide this raw data at the top of the map. Back into our Python script again. We'll find our raw data section, which is here, and we're going to replace that. So this is a simple if statement. If the checkbox is equal to show the raw data, it'll write the data out, otherwise it won't do anything. Let's have a look how that works. We'll commit those changes again. We'll flick back to our application. This will refresh, and I've simply got a checkbox here. Only check that box. Straight away, bang, I get the, the raw data appearing. So really easy to add this interactivity into your Streamlit application. And so that's it. That's what I wanted to show you in this first um, run through of Streamlit, how to sign up for it, how to connect it to GitHub, how to add headings, subheadings, histograms, move data into a data frame that's available publicly by an S3 bucket. Again, you don't need to interact with the AWS Management Console or anything like that. It's simply going into your code, using your Python, bringing that data back, using that data as efficiently as possible by caching that data, and then adding on a number of interactive objects directly onto your application. In subsequent videos, I'm going to show you how you combine this then with data that's in Snowflake, as well as then extending that further by using Python, Snowpark, and Streamlit as we start to work through this. So I hope you find that useful. If you did, keep watching, keep subscribing. New videos come in very soon. I also wanted to let you know about our Master in Snowflake program with myself that we run, and it's, it's an exclusive signature program to help you master Snowflake and learn how to design, implement, and scale solutions in the cloud. And I've designed this program specifically for those people who have either scratched the surface using Snowflake or who are stuck working with legacy on-premise technologies and haven't been invested in by their companies and have fallen behind in their career. And what I've done is packaged up my knowledge and experience of working with Snowflake since 2017 in learning how to package up Snowflake's out-of-the-box capabilities in a way where you can apply them in the real world to address common challenges. So this program isn't about theory. Of course, I need to introduce you to the concepts if you're new to Snowflake, and many of my members are, but it's really about introducing the theory and then in practice how you apply those in the real world. I've been through the pain of understanding what works and what doesn't. Now I've got a formula or a set of recipes, if you like, I'll show you how to do that. So the Master in Snowflake program includes in-depth, on-demand video course content that I've created that all include practical hands-on demos. I provide access to all the code, templates, and files that I use as part of those demos. So you can download them and use them freely. You may want to use them in your day-to-day -day work. You may want to take them and customize them and use them as a starting point. All members on the program get exclusive access to a members-only group where everybody can help each other out and share their knowledge and best practice and get expert advice. Finally, I also carry out a group 60 minute coaching call with all the members, totally optional, where you can ask me anything about Snowflake, data analytics, data strategy, data architecture, you name it, um, interview advice, and I can help you and give my um, input and help and support and guidance around that. Finally, you'll get lifetime access to all future updates. Snowflake's changing and evolving. There's new features and releases every week, and you'll continue to benefit from those updates as well. At a high level, there's 10 modules. This is what we cover, everything ranging from the Snowflake architecture to getting data into Snowflake. And then once you've got data, how do you effectively use it, secure it, share it, and work with it to ensure that you get the maximum value from your Snowflake implementation? If you're interested, I've included the application link in the video description below. If this sounds like the thing that you're looking for and you want to supercharge your career, and if you're ready to take the ultimate step, I'd really encourage you to fill out the application form below.